This is Critical Nonsense, our high lowbrow show about culture, science, and tech. This week, Aaron asks us about spontaneous brilliance. Woo! So awake in the morning and a step out. This is what a Joey sounds like. That was <laughs> There's really... a terrible rendition. No, three. There are three of them and they aren't blondes and I'm into it. <laughs> they're non. Uh, they're non. non. Um, I will do have... You ever heard the wolf cry to the blue corn? Aaron, this is what an Aaron sounds like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. this is what an executive producer and grandmother Oak, Jess Vander, sounds like. (laughs) Hi, this is Jess. (laughs) Kind of our grandmother Oak, I I will say. No, it's fair. It's fair. But mine was Pocahontas. You were doing Tiana, weren't you? Princess Tiana? Right? Isn't that where the... No. Gr- in, is, what is the tree character in Pocahontas? Isn't her name Grandmother Willow. Oak? Come Grandmother on. Willow. Oh, shit. Oh. We're Get oh. it together. I mean, even no I... No trees. Corrections department. Not a Philadelphian <laughs> here. <Yeah. laughs> you know what we should just do is just go watch Fern Gully. Let's just take... Call it yeah. call a mulligan oh. and let's do Fern Gully instead. Yeah. Aaron, do you know? Gulligan. Do you know what Gulligan. we should do? What should we do? Aaron, <laughs> what? Let's get down to business <laughs> and answer your questions. Okay, you're right. No. Okay. Yeah, our house is clean. Rate, review, subscribe. We're getting to the question. That was really. I like that segue. So I have. <laughs> you know. You know. Yeah, we're trying to tighten up. Uh, t- uh, tighten up the top. Let the gyroscope cruise yes. down on a tourist view. <laughs> Around Paris, the Segway tour. Okay, and wow, we're back. Wow. All right, I'm going to try to bolt these wheels back on. So um, <laughs> I actually have to credit where this thought and question comes from to Joey, actually, because well, before we recorded, right, we were, if I remember correctly, we were just talking about... Um, we were talking about, you know, recently the the Kamala and Trump debate that happened a couple of weeks ago. And um, Seth Meyers, along with a number of other uh, late night shows, I think the Daily Show might have done one immediately afterward, did this thing that just like blew the minds of anyone who appreciates collaborative creativity at all, which is going live with a full episode an hour afterward uh, and having like you know, fairly erudite analysis and not only even less analysis more, but, but deep insight, right? Like comedy is about insight. So you have to like capture all these things on the fly and then figure out how to articulate them, construct them, produce a piece of like video content with no rehearsal and just put it into the world and assume that it merits, uh, the hundreds of thousands of dollars of ad spend that uh, need to come in to support it every week to say nothing of the eyeballs to actually tune in and watch it. Uh, And so in inspiring us with the, the, with just that like example, I think we all had a question that I will ask back to you, which is (laughs) how do you do spontaneous brilliance? My little giggle. Why did the spontaneous? I I like to be candid. I, I'm sort of like gobsmacked, right? Mm. For mm. I for the debate to end at nine fifty nine, and at ten p.m. you go live with a comedy show. We were we were talking about it like they had not finished the show that they were actively recording. Like there's just no way they they had not finished the show that they were actively recording. And it's it's sort of like, yes, the brilliance of the writers to be able to like make jokes and commentary like so quickly right you know i'm assuming maybe it's on some sort of like sliding scale like your opening bits are about the beginning of the debate and your Mm -hmm. closing bits are about the end of the debate maybe but beyond writing jokes that are funny and and whatever like 
for the video team to be like, hey, they just added a joke that took place. We need a clip from minute 47. Uh, like, oh, that's what the segment was called. Uh, By the way, I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> but please, would you mind reading aloud the actual yeah. title of the segment, which is typically entitled A Closer Look? Yeah, the segment was titled Closest Fucking Look We've Ever Taken in Our Motherfucking Lives. <laughs> amazing that doesn't uh, fit on a mug that doesn't fit on a mug but yeah. i love it uh, i mean it it does feel like maybe i don't know like we did some talks yesterday for fast company and one of and the talk that i gave was about discomfort and like part of me is like were they just like hey this is getting kind of easy to do this show every day like meanwhile <laughs> yeah. like which it already seems insane like let's just do it with no pro let's like fly like take the plane off while we're still building it you think like it was that they're just like i wonder what it would be like if we made it more insane (laughs) well and that says something about spontaneous brilliance that maybe it needs a like a little combination of boredom and safety yeah like if you're really good and you're really bored then maybe you can try something and maybe it will be spontaneously combustible Mm -hmm. or maybe (laughs) it'll be spontaneously brilliant i love well and funny i think that that's i hear this a lot from comedians where some some writers are absolutely like or they perform things that have to be filmed and like uh they don't want an audience around few fewer of those then there's the group that wants them filmed with an audience around and you get a little bit of a reaction and that'll give you some steers on like what's landing what's not can you play with like how you land a joke or that sort of thing but then you get these crazy stand up like people who are let me just go and like th- my best guess and like yes it's based on like years of experience of everybody involved as to like what does and doesn't work and a lot of instinct but i think to your point like when you feel i think a lot of what i hear them talk about is like you it's the unpredictability that puts you in dialogue with an audience that makes live mm-hmm. performance more interesting than scripted performance because there's always an element of you don't know what's going to happen. It's the same thing in sports. Mm-hmm. It's the exact same thing. You don't the game is always the game. It's always the foosball with the gr- the grass and then the Michigan 49ers against the San Francisco oil <laughs> oily pants. You know, and they're and they're they sorry sorry they had some Alestra. They were eating a lot of nuts. They are nuts and then Alestra because it's about twenty years ago. Yes, yes. And the Haribo sugar free gummy bears. <laughs> yes. Like, I'm sorry, guys. You know, I don't know the sports balls. I mixed so, so much many. there. So so many references there. But like the game is always the same. You just don't know what the outcome is going to be. You don't know how it's going to play. You don't know the little things. And that's what makes it exciting as an audience. And then as pro- as a performer, you also want that same amount of unpredictability to move and flex and be surprised. And that risk getting out of the boredom, you have to have that boredom at first to then be able to savor the tightrope and to just mm. run at it. And if it falls flat, it falls flat. But the fun is in trying it. Um, And this is like the jazz conversation we were having recently, too, right? Where you're like leaping and trust falling and doing (laughs) listening deeply and like leaning into mistakes. And, you know, there's like you have to have a different kind of mindset when you are um, trying to like you can't and like you can't try too hard to make it great. You just have to keep going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the pressure part, I think, is has like if we're talking about like spontaneous brilliance, yeah, and maybe there are exceptions and you know, like savant type people in any domain, but I feel I'm thinking about when and Aaron, maybe I don't know what your sort of preparation process is when you're doing like a talk at a conference. Like, you know, if I'm if I'm doing a big stage. Like I'll try to spend the day before like 
you know, go through the talk and repeat it and make sure I know the beats. And, you know, I'll, I'll be like practicing in my hotel room and standing and be like, and then maybe I'll have this gesture. Like, I'm not thinking about it so hard, but I'm like, oh man, this isn't like, it's not quite feeling how I want. And then you go and do it on the stage and you're kind of, you like black out a little bit because yes. there's like the yes. pres- the pressure of that moment. And it goes so much better yes. at least uh, for me that that pressure at least turns something on where you're like, I'm hitting the note. So like the, the adrenaline or whatever it is about that moment where you're like, oh, well, this went way better than the 17 times that I went through this presentation yesterday by myself in a room, like, you know, not having that kind of energy and need to be on. Yes. And so I don't like, did, does that resonate? A hundred percent. I mean, like for like anyone who was a theater kid understands that one of the biggest values of doing theater as a kid is being face to face with stage fright and then pushing through it and then mm-hmm. learning and becoming comfortable with being the center of attention. Like and and mm-hmm. dealing with that and dealing with like the fact that you are going to mess up in front of a room full of people and you will still live. You're not it's not mm-hmm. going to just like all be terrible. And once you get through that, I think that then you start to learn how to read a crowd, how to read an audience. You start to listen for silence. You start to listen for chuckles and different scales of laughter to make sure that your your dialogue doesn't get stepped on and that people can hear what you're saying. And so that's always perhaps unsurprisingly at the heart of when I'm preparing for giving a talk. Like I, I have the exact same blackout right before <laughs> like, and, and it, I, I, I get close to cold sweats and like shaky palms and all of that. And then I just go out there and it's like Enya in my head, say hello, way, say hello. Just like <laughs> everything's poof. But, the zone that I get into, especially if it's a, um, a scripted talk, as opposed to something that's more like a panel or it's something that is extemporaneous, extemporaneous yeah. is that I still break away. I still break away from whatever the flow is to just check in with the audience. Like, I'm always like, you feel me? Like, I need some. And I, I should also add, like, I grew up in a church family. Like, my uncle, my grandfather was in the church. My mom always played in the church. So, like dialogue and seeing this sort of like crowd participation is what makes me feel comfortable. So if I'm up Mm. there and it's dead silent, I might as well just be doing this at home against a wall. I Mm -hmm. want a chuckle. I want a, Ooh, I need a reaction and I will Mm. interrupt myself just to be like, no matter how big the stage is, you you guys still out there? Y'all with me? I like, this is an airplane. You're in the exit row. Give me a yes or a no. Like (laughs) this is not that. And so like those moments, yes, it is. I suppose the spontaneous side, it's not the brilliant side, but I do Mm -hmm. think that in addition to pressure, there is an, there is a really powerful element of dialogue or conversation. Um, Mm -hmm. whether it be, um, you know, whether it just be like crowd to performer, um, or perceived crowd to performer or just in conversation with two individuals who are collaborating on something. I think that that's where Mm -hmm. the brilliance pops up because it's like, we're searching for the thing. We're searching for the thing. And that's when the thing pops up and one of you says it and like shows it to the world. And it's everybody else gets to share in that light bulb moment. Yeah. I want almost, it makes me want to, imagine like another another type of flow Mm. like in this case like peopling Mm. for like peopling you have to just like fully embrace your like your sort of uh subconscious peopling skills and just like trust in that Mm. in this mode um and then the other you know the ingredient of pressure like you were saying joey like it's not exactly the same though it's it's because it's not uh, the same as flow in that it's not about the challenge necessarily it's like maybe it's its own formula of pressure plus like this other mode of whatever is like the fundamental skill 
um, and like, and not worrying about the output. Like there's gotta be some combination of those things where then you can just, I mean, like I'm, I was trying to think in my own head of like how this works in jewelry making where like if you don't, if you have something very specific in mind, then it's, then maybe you're in having like a flow conversation where it's a matter of like you mm. versus the challenge ahead of you and whether you can actually achieve that thing versus like spontaneous brilliance. You it's like, it's a different mm. set of ingredients to figure out like, are you gonna, I, you can't promise like there, inherently you cannot promise that at the end of this you're going to have the thing that you set out to because you don't even you're not setting out to you have no idea um so what mm -hmm. else goes in <laughs> instead yeah like the 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 thing that you said about it made me think about not not being precious like and you what you said too aaron is like you're nervous and you have like the sort of knock knees and sweaty hands and then the moment you go out on stage, it's like, I'm already doing it. Like, I right. can't be nervous about yeah. what's going to happen in the future because it's now, <laughs> you know, yeah. or like the that that like you're at a point where the the filtering and the editing and the censoring can't happen. And so maybe in like that live show where they would sit typically on a day to day, even if it's fast, they're in a writer's room and they're trying to write jokes and they're like, that's not funny or like. Oh, I don't know about that. There, you just have to be like, I have these skills, and we don't have yeah. time to like apply like seventy five felt. You're just like more in an instinctive place, yeah. Uh, yes. Or like w with jewelry making, right? It's like I, I think too, like Aaron, that conversation bit. Like when you're performing on a stage with a talk, you have to. You're it's the audience. When you're doing jewelry making, it's like the the metal maybe or Speak whatever the me. materials are Speak to me. like mm -hmm. yeah. that mm -hmm. particular bit and the, the sort of particular composite of this specific bit of alloy is going to be different. And it's going to be saying things back to you. And it's like, I don't want to bend like that. I want to bend like this. So you have to be in the dialogue with whatever the brilliance is, another person, a thing you're writing or whatever. It's just like it, that those words don't work together. They just don't like, you know, I'm just going to have to go. Yes, it's so true. And it, I guess uh, it didn't, it doesn't have to be comedy related, but it also reminded me of what makes a good game of quiplash. Oh, played yes. It, the, the Jackbox <laughs> game, which mm. is a uh, sort of like a, a pack of mini games that you can get online. And um, this game for those uh, unacquainted is basically where uh, everyone logs in on their phone to this site and it gives you a prompt and then you go your your answer to that prompt later gets displayed head to head with somebody else's but you who said what is anonymous and everybody else at the party gets to vote on which they think won and what makes for really good mm -hmm. quiplash games and like the winners are always the people who like bring the like relevant party humor mm -hmm. and like not just like not just like yeah, yeah okay that's a reference we all know but it's like oh that is such thoughtful timing and you had 30 seconds to put it down and you just did it which not saying that's like uh the likes of us mere mortals getting anywhere close to the um the the closest effing look we've ever taken in our mother effing lives but it's like kind of that it's kind of the instinct and also the dialoguing and also yeah it's like it's totally and there's you know a friend of mine is he's so good at quiplash and it's because he is so fast i have never met anyone who is intellectually as quick as he is he is fast with a comeback fast with a thing and uh, someone else pointed out to me that, like, yeah, everything he drops isn't hilarious, isn't brilliant. But the fact that he can move so fast means that he gets to take more swings. And so he drops mm. them more. And so, like, there's sure. still a greater preponderance of things that are like, holy shit, that that was the one. Um, and then I also I love the example of Quiplash because there's also like the the someone will always do a joke that has to do with someone else at the party and i i remember there was a guy that, that we're all playing quiplash there's somebody whose name was tom and like he was the one person that didn't know anybody else 
and oh, Tom. poor Tom <laughs> and sweet oh, Tom sweet is like Tom. trying and we're all like being really raunchy and ridiculous and Tom's just like I don't know what's going on and so then some of the answers just started being just Tom and then they would be like <laughs> Tom too and then later on in the night it would just be like Tom Tom and it just became it, it was dumb it was so stupid but it's something that could it was it was brilliant in that moment it was funny to all of us and it only could have like happened in that moment with those people then, then. Right, exactly and, and like the timing of it it was absolutely a you had to be there you know what i mean of like how does that make people yeah, like tom tom is not a great punchline let's no just say no that let's be objectively terrible like not funny <laughs> i think we can circle that and say unfunny thanks yeah contextually so, hilarious and contextually so, perfect you had to yeah. be there that that i love like how the elements of context and like gut instinct, gut intelligence, driving, like having the wheel, that yeah, that shit makes brilliance happen. I love that, and taking lots and lots of yeah, swings. yeah, take it like the intuition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it comes back to it comes back to like uh, because I think maybe tell me if this is is how you were thinking of it because I don't I I had not crystallized this before, but like spontaneous brilliance is not like about objective brilliance like right. in the way that right. we think right it's not like i spontaneously came up with a proof to mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you know some mathematics thing which could happen certainly mm -hmm. but like what we're talking about is like in the moment like you're in a conversation with your environment or like that feels like maybe you know your point about conversation is more important than the pressure point maybe pressure is relevant to like get you to the place of listening to your instincts. But yeah. like stand up comedians have done those reps so many times that they just, they know how to be in the instinct zone without having to be like, I'm scared of everyone here or something, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I will bring this one back to Jess Vander, who, you know, maybe it was said before, but I'm going to, I'm going to attribute it to Jess. She was, you know, teaching and, and, and surfacing to the whole company, right, when it comes to insights, what makes a good insight when it comes to our work, when it comes to strategy work. And um, it has always stuck with me. It's just the difference. Like a, a bad insight is an uh-huh. A good insight is an aha. And from uh-huh uh -huh to aha, articulating that insight in a way that you get to that light bulb. I think is that's the that you're exactly right, Joey. Like when that light bulb goes off, no matter what the context is, like that's the thing that is in my definition, that spontaneous, that that feeling of brilliance. And sometimes it's about it's it's always about like the speed at which that thing is packaged to meet the context that it is in. If you can do it fast, if it's articulated right in whatever that thing is and it comes at the right time, that light bulb goes off and I feel like I feel like there's a very healthy chunk of my life that is just chasing those light bulbs. Like that's it it yeah. is so motivating strategy. and so Boom. awesome. Strategy. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> she did it. Yes. Do it. Do it. I was going to say I think I might have a, a tight wrap up corner. Do it. Okay. Do uh, it. I also do. So uh, let's let's do this. Ryan Reynolds okay, wraps over here. Wrap up corner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you want first or second? <laughs> you go first. You okay, already yep. said you yep. have. The, you've got the yep. tape. All right. Ready? <laughs> I'm sorry. This is wrap I'm up versus. <laughs> I just have to say that. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Tom. Tom. Spontaneous brilliance comes from your tum tum. <laughs> Oh. That's pretty damn good. Oh. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> Jess? Um, wow, I'm <laughs> speechless. <laughs> that just that just blew me away. Wow. <laughs> um huh, that is so different. Uh okay. Um, so yeah, so there are five roles of spontaneous brilliance, <laughs> <laughs> pressure, instinct, dialogue, speed, and insight. Pressure makes for the environment that forces you to listen to your instincts 
And in that moment, you must interact and dialogue with the context surrounding you. Don't be afraid to do it fast so you can take more swings. And hopefully you light up the bulb. Or it sucks, but whatever. (laughs) This. Yo, those were both really good. And I think... (laughs) Somehow, I think that this might be the most effective episode of Critical Nonsense that I can think of. Like, we asked a question. Oh my God, did we do it? I think we just did, did we? it. We just did it. Wow. We actually did this time. We've been saying for 280 episodes that we did it. But we did this it. This time, we weren't lying. We did it. Wow. So true. Every time we're like, well, we did it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're like trying to convince ourselves that we did right. something. Oh, I love, I love this. Oh, I love this man. time. Good job. Yeah. Good raps. Yeah, Good raps. Okay. 280 swings. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow we'd be like, I don't know. It's horrible. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Grandmother Oak, what was I thinking? <laughs> uh, all right, ready? Critical Nonsense is a Sylvain production. Brought to you by Not Spontaneous, Not Combustion. I am not creative enough to also make sure that combustion was brilliance. <laughs> <laughs> taking a swing, as guys. Always, we taking lo- a swing. That's all that was. <laughs> as always, we'd like to thank our executive producer and the hard and fast rules you must follow for spontaneity, Jess Vander. <laughs> Sounds like me. We would also like to thank Sound Engineer and truly the 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 light bulb uh, to my soul, uh, Sound Engineer Alex Contel. Yeah. We'd like to thank our programming coordinator and the spontaneous brilliance like Athena jumping from Zeus's head, Les what? Jacobs. Wow. Wow. Uh, we also appreciate the production help that we get from the Siren song. Of Sarah Gilbert, Nora Mestrich, <laughs> Christy Jensen, and Amy Waters. Mm. And as always, thanks, Ellen. <laughs> oh. Special thanks mm. to Greek mythology, apparently. How yep. was Athena born? I'm sorry. Yeah. Apparently, <laughs> I'm today years old to yes. discover that this myth goes, Athena was produced without a mother and emerged full grown from his forehead. Just, just, wow. just stepped right out. Just junior, it, junior, junior. The Mary Poppins <laughs> pocketbook of children. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. <laughs> Zeus's forehead. Everyone knows Zeus's forehead is like Mary Poppins pocketbook. It's, yeah, yeah. It's canon, canon. Wow, that is so right. Um. I I I want to thank Polly Pocket, even though it's not related. I also really want to thank, and I'll put it in the show notes, there's a Patton Oswald interview with Michael Rosenbaum, who played Lex Luthor on Smallville uh, in the CW days. He's obviously had many other acting credits. I don't remember them. He's got a podcast. I'm going to put it down below, because Patton Oswald talks a lot about the like spontane- spontaneity of live performance and how much that keeps him going. Mm. Well... I would love to listen to that. Mm. I do, yeah, true. I, I'd also like to thank the three forgotten tree streets of Philadelphia. Mm. Um, Sassafras, which is now Reese Street. Mulberry, which is now Arch Street. Mm. And Cedar, which is now South Street. We don't forget you, Sassafras, Mulberry, and Cedar. You will be forever trees in our minds because be, be, because they're the streets of Philadelphia if you don't know the song it will be in the show notes guys streets of Philadelphia yeah. check it out and, and you know in Philadelphia fashion don't worry tree streets will always water you ooh 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 he pulled wow. out the water Oh, that's rude. We'll get the witter, we'll get the witter at the Wawa's and uh, uh, mm. Yo, y'all, y'all what? who are listening, y'all drag him. Drag him. Drag get in there him. and drag him. He deserves to go be down dragged. to Delco. Mm. Mm. Oh no. All right. Oh boy. Uh, I think we undid okay, it. Love Thanks, you. guys. It. Bye. <laughs> Bye. I think we did we undo <laughs> We undid it. We undid it. <laughs> That's what Aaron said. It's true. Yeah. The weave, okay. the weave is fraying. <laughs> Bye. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god!
this will please, never end. Please, please. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.